everybody welcome. We're here today to celebrate the life of William Brooks and Buddy Taylor. Son 
sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so that you will not grieve like the people that have no hope. A lot will be said today, but nothing that we'll say will be more important than the Word of God. Let's pray. Lord, we come together today in both joy and sorrow. Jesus, we ask that you let your presence continue to manifest in this place as we gather here to mourn our beloved William Brooks, Buddy <coughs> Tucker. We mourn our loss, yet we rejoice that Buddy will no longer experience the pain or sickness or sorrow that he has lived through. We thank you for his transition to a new and better life. Lord, may you bring healing into our hearts. I ask for your comfort for all Buddy's <coughs> family and friends. We know it'll be hard for everyone to fill the gap that's been left in our hearts. But we also know, dear Jesus, that in the days, weeks, and months to come, you will heal us. And what we will be left with are the fond memories of the times we shared with you. May your love shine on all of us, and may we each know the mercy and grace that only you can give. Bless us, Lord Jesus, with a sense of your goodness and give us peace. We thank you, Lord, for his transition to a new and better life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, I don't know the order any of the children may want to speak. Tina, if you will let, let y'all go ahead and say a few words if you want to.
time I was saved, I was on my knees praying, Lord, please save my daddy. And he, he wouldn't have it. You know, he, y'all know him. He had an alcoholic lifestyle. He was an alcoholic. And he wasn't having it. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And listen to what this card says in his handwriting. Um, thank you for being here for the last six years. No money in the world can ever pay you for the kindness and love you show. Thank you for not letting me go all these years. Thank you for, for thank you finally bear, bearable the hand of Jesus that has been in my face all these years. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I've got that hand now that will never let go. I mean those words. Um or let go of you either. I love you and I'm blessed by God's word. Always I will love all your family and my family. My gift to you is never letting go of my Lord and Savior. And I don't care what I had to go through. Out of all the praying in the world, anything I've ever told anybody, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up praying. And Brandon and Crystal, there's nothing more in this world that Daddy wanted than for you to know the Lord. Nothing more, nothing more in this world for all of us to know that one day he's going to heaven and we're all going to be there with him. And that was that was his greatest wish from me to you, kid. Brandon, you were Crystal. Anybody else that may want to say anything? Memories or just anything? Okay, we're going to have to be gone back for a minute. I do. Say it. You know, Buddy, when he started coming to church here, me and him hit it off just like that. Later on, I knew why. I was an alcoholic bad alcoholic. In fact, I lost my music career with RCA Records because of alcohol. We became just like that. And uh, I gave him a CD and a song that I recorded a long time ago. It became a big super hit for me. It's called it was John 3.16. Kind of like my testimony song. And I remember here, I don't know, a good while ago, he came up to me and said, Hey, you got another one of them CDs? I said, I didn't give you one, but He said, I know if it stays in my car, I done wore that thing slap out. It won't even play John 316 anymore. <laughs> so I gave him another one. And then the last Sunday, about three Sundays ago, was the last time he was here, I come in, well, before that, it's been about four months ago, I come walking in, he's always giving me a fit. Always. And he handed me a little bitty piece of paper about like this. He said, here, take this. He said, this is what I want you to do at my funeral. I said, what funeral? He said, my funeral, I want you to sing these songs for me. And I stuck it in my pocket, I said, you ain't going nowhere. He said, buddy was ready. Buddy was ready. And this ain't sad for me, it's a celebration. Because I know, I seen that man from where he come from and where he was. I was a happy man because he was ready to go. He gave me the songs he wanted me to do. He already had it ready. He had it planned out and ready. And he was ready to go meet the maker. I'm just kind of mad at him because he kind of beat me there. And I know when I get there, he's going to give me the same hard time he always gives me when I come in here. So I'm looking forward to that. But three weeks ago, when he was here the last time, he was showing his oats that Sunday morning. Was he not, y'all? He was full of himself. And I come in, he grabbed me by the hand, he said, Hey, if you try hard this morning, you might get saved. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but buddy, I love you, my brother. And I'm going to see you soon. Don't worry, I'm getting prepared because I know you're going to hit me with it the time I get there. I know that. But this is for you. This is what you wanted, brother. I 
Then that was covered. His power, love, and salvation. The three things that all of us have to have to succeed. But he was an overcomer. He was not satisfied with the normal. He wanted more. And the world wants to take that more away from all of us. And how great it was to be the pastor that got to know Buddy. And got to know all about the fight that he had to overcome the world. And how Jesus made it all possible. And it's possible for for all 
of us. No matter who you are or what's going on in your life, it can all be fixed in a second when we open our heart and we allow Jesus to come in and to change everything. You know, there's no words that can explain that moment. And what an honor it was to rebaptize Buddy and to listen to the surety in his heart that when the time come, he was going home. He was going home. And that hand, that hand that he had a hold to, he was going to see the nail stars and know beyond a shadow of a doubt. He didn't have a few days. He didn't have a few months. He has an immortal body and an eternity to enjoy the fellowship with other believers. And it, it is so awesome to see everyone that knew Buddy and that turned out today to celebrate his life. Yeah, I, I got to meet you know, it's, it's funny when I look at Williams Brooke Taylor. I mean, I, I knew Buddy. And the first time I met him, he always stood on the outside the door there until till church started. And me and my wife had come back. We was gone for a while. And and I introduced myself to him. And he said, uh, I understand you're a kid. I'm like, yeah. He said, I am the kid. <laughs> I said, oh, really? He said, yes. He said, I got a tag in front of my car. He just says kid, but I am the kid. And I'm like, well, buddy, I'm just kid. <laughs> what, a, what a great joy it was to get to know him and to learn all about his life and his family. And how much he loved Jesus. And how much he loved his family. And his desire that each one would come to know Jesus. I want to share a scripture that I, as I was praying this morning, not only for our church service, this morning, but for for what God would have me to share that would be from Buddy's heart. It, it's Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, or peril? Or sword. And then verse 37 says, Yet in all of these things, we are more than just conquerors through Him who loved us. I want to interject there who loved us first. No matter what we've done, Jesus loves us. He loves us enough to die for us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, neither height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I believe that sums Buddy up. His thoughts and his heart for each and every one of us. That we come to know Jesus Christ. That we have that moment when we know that we know that we know we will spend eternity 
together. Yeah, I'm sure all of y'all have churches you go to. There may be some that doesn't have a church. But there is a place. There is a place. And how great it was to learn that Tina prayed for her daddy. And prayer works. Prayer works so much. I want to close with this. Having the opportunity to be but his pastor, every time he came, at the end of the service, I could set my watch. He was coming up. He was coming up to be prayed for. But not only to be prayed for, to tell me how happy he was. To tell me how great things were. To tell me that he knew. He knew when it was done, he was going home. And for a few months, he was struggling. When he was in the hospital and he was out. But when he had the fluid thrown off, he got his color back. I mean, that was the peak. He was on top then. And he'd come up that Sunday. And usually he would come up halfway and he'd sit down. And then he'd get up, he'd come up and up a few more rows and he'd sit down. But that last time he was here, he'd come all the way up. And he stood there waiting because we had some other people. And I took his hand. I said, buddy, you look good. He says, oh, I feel good. I feel good. And we shared a little bit, and I prayed for him. And I said, you know, I'll be looking forward to seeing you next Sunday. And he turned. And he would always say, when I say, well, we're going to see you next Sunday, or we'll be praying for you, he'd say, okay, and he'd hug me. But he turned, and I said, look forward to seeing you next Sunday. And he got about here and he looked back and said, maybe, maybe. He knew he was going home. He knew he was going to see Jesus. And that's my prayer for everybody in here. That you will know, that you know, that you know, that you're going to see Jesus. Because we're all going to have that day, preparing the second coming. We're all going to see Jesus. So thank you for letting me share. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, this is another one that Buddy wanted because he flew. He spread his wings and he flew. <laughs> Stand up, stand up.
But he went a step farther. He got our hedge trimmers. You know, back in the days, there wasn't no electric hedge trimmers or nothing. You had to do it by hand. And uh, he got a hold of edge around everything. He would made you proud in the landscaping business at 12 years old. He charged a little bit more than what most of them were used to paying. But he did such a great job. He did not spend his money. If I got a dollar, 95 cents of it was gone within a few hours. But he got a dollar, a nickel might be gone that day. He saved every dime back then. And he'd go out and take what money he had made and invest it in more lawn care equipment. He had push lawnmowers, and each time he'd get another piece of equipment, he'd hire another kid in the neighborhood to come help him do the work. He, uh, Ace Hardware, one of them called my one day, did, uh, buddy was up there trying to pass a bad check. He goes up, Mom goes up to see what's going on. He's buying a riding lawnmower. She said, yeah, he's got the money. Let him have it. So he buys this riding lawnmower. Hires him another kid to work. Before it's over, he's got several lawnmowers. He's got rakes. He's got hoes. He's got edge clippers. He's got every kid in the neighborhood just about working for him. Some of them are cutting their own parents' yard. And I, I asked one of them, hey, you know, Duh, why aren't you doing this for your mom and daddy? You know, well, they don't pay as good. I mean, he's paying kids by the hour to get out here and work in the neighborhood. Uh, and like I say, he saved his money. One day they called mom and said, uh, from the Honda dealer, which was maybe a half mile from the house. Again, buddy's up here trying to pass a bad check. You need to come up here and see about him. She said, well, what's he want? Well, he's trying to buy this little Honda 100. Uh, she said, well, how much? And that was like $450 or so. She said, well, he's got it in the bank, but he didn't have it. You know, I mean, that's how, and this is like 13 years old. Now, that being said, that little Honda motorcycle got put in a lot of hot water over the time. Uh, one day in particular, him and Earl, that was his side kick in the day. They come down and get me from work, uptown Augusta. We take off riding around and get down to Walton Way. Now, Buddy and Earl don't have a helmet on. I do. I'm, I'm a good law-abiding young man. I got a driver's license. Buddy's 13 years old, maybe 14. Don't have a license. Uh, city motorcycle cop goes in behind us. Well, we turn off the Heckle Street there off Walton Way, forked off, and for about 50 yards, it was one way. He got the first intersection because he didn't want you coming out on the walkway. So, motorcycle cop gets behind us. We think, okay, well, we'll just get over here and he'll go straight. Well, he did. He pulled Buddy and Earl over. So, I go up maybe as far as from here to the back wall of the church. Make a U turn and come back. The cop says, Do you have a license? Oh, yes, sir. Here you go. He said, okay, good. So he starts giving Buddy the third degree about you can't ride a motorcycle 100 cc's or less inside the city limit. You got to have a helmet. You got to have a driver's license. Okay, you two can go on. Just don't even catch you in the city again. I fired up my bike. Whoa, wait a minute. You hang around. I get a ticket. <laughs> he lets him go. I get a ticket for going the wrong way on the one way for just turning around and coming back to see what they're in trouble for. I end up having to sit in city court every week, every Saturday morning from 9 till noon while they bring in all the drunks and all the domestic abusers and all the speeders. And I guess that's where I decided to go into law enforcement. I was going to spend my time up there in the jailhouse. I might as well be on the right side of it. But over the years, Buddy continued to build that, that business reputation. Uh, he got into the trucking, and yes, he got into all kind of hot water over it. But as he moved up into these, started managing these truck companies, uh, 
got out here today to work with him over at American Freight uh, back in the day. Uh, you know, they were sending people from all over the country for Buddy to train them. Teach them how to, how to do the, what he's doing to make get the business in there. Uh, and he's got all these diplomas hanging on his wall. And all the big wheels <laughs> think, hey, that's cool. You know, we got this guy, he's a psychologist, he's a business major, he got it maybe. He he's sharp. We know what he, he knows what he's doing. Uh Lord mercy, poor boy. <laughs> he just it was always something. He always though had that angel riding with Buddy no matter what he did. Like I was talking about the motorcycle. He didn't get in any trouble over that. He did, you know, it's okay, going down the road. Me, I end up in court with a oh, and they suspended my driver's license also until I finished my little court appearances. Uh, one morning he's going to work, coming down Peach Orchard Road, where Peach Orchard and Gordon Highway come together. It got, it, there's enough room for two cars, but there's little yellow lines until you get over so you can merge. It's foggy in his windows, his mirrors, he can't see out. All he sees is that head like to dive out that left side and come around him on his little yellow line. He said, oh, no, I don't think so. He got one of them 400 cubic inch uh, Pontiac Grand Am at the time. He stands on it. It's the highway patrol county cop that's trying to get around him to go down the road. Pulls him over again. Don't do that no more. He's going home or going to work. I've been under the jail. But but he had that, that ain't oh. When he was doing the grass cutting business and doing all this other stuff, 14, 12, 13, 14 years old, he started buying cars. Little English Ford. Do you remember them things? Oh, that's another one of them with Earl. They'd buy these cars and get them running, and some of them had sell, some of them did keep. Well, I go down there one day, and there's a, one of these little English forwards in Earl's front yard tore all two pieces. I mean, just banged all of them. What happened? Well, they decided they wanted to be Hollywood stuntmen, Earl and Bud. They had this one English forward they couldn't get running. So they push it up to the top of the hill, so on a big drive there. Now, remember, these cars didn't have seat belts back in them days. They took rope, put it under the seat rails, tied a knot in it, strapped herself in, roll it down the street fast as they go, get the Earl's front yard. There's a curve about like this, kind of a little bump. <coughs> Turn it hard to the right and see how many times they roll it with them strapped in with a rope. <laughs> I mean, you know, again, I'd have been coming to see you, Jesus. But not buddy, no. no. Uh, as we all know, Buddy did have his demons. When Buddy got to drinking, Buddy got mean. He would get uh, very mean. Uh, very stupid. I mean, I've seen him fight with his friends over nothing but just because he was drinking. Uh, but when he wasn't drinking, he was as good as gold. But the minute he'd start hitting that bottle, start hitting them beers, he would just get, get absolutely crazy. Well, about 10 years ago, Diane and I started coming to this church. And there was everything I could do. Buddy, please, just come on. Come on, to, come with us to church. Uh, me and him fought like cats and dogs. I mean, we... I've actually had him out in the front yard and head like just beat me one time. You know, mama hit me in the back. I'm all, yeah, I'm going to call the cops. Well, you better call our ambulance too. I think he's going to need it. But uh, oh, that's just the way we roll. Uh, uh, it was strange. He come in here that first day and Pastor Jack Atkinson, for the ones of you that went here, Jack Atkinson, like, Brian, Pastor Jack was a total man of God. If there was any man that God spoke to, it was Jack Atkins. We stepped in here and we sit down back there. We used to sit on the ninth row. I didn't want too close up here in front. I didn't want nobody to see me. We sit back there. So I called Buddy. 
He finally comes to church with us one morning. Jack stands up here on the pulpit and he says, I don't know, there's somebody in this church that needs to hear this. I had a sermon prepared, but I'm going to push it aside. Because there's somebody here that needs to hear it. Jack got to talking about brothers. And Buddy is sitting over there by me and I and the whole time he's like this. He called me that evening crying. I was on the way back for the evening service and he's just bawling. He said, why did you tell that preacher about me? I said, buddy, I hadn't said a word to that preacher about you. I didn't even know you were coming until you showed up. He said, well, you know he was stepping on my toe. I said, oh, yes, yeah, no doubt in my mind. He said, well, I want you to know I love you. And I'm sorry for the way I've treated you all these years, for the things I've done to you. He said, uh, I am so sorry. Don't tell it to me, brother. Tell it to God. Thank you, but you got to get right. Well, he started coming. It might be once every six months, might be every seven months, then it got down where it'd be every three or four months, and then it might drift off to six months again. And it took the Lord knocking him down saying, okay, enough. You know, you got to listen to me. He had a 14%. His heart was beating at 14% when he came through that, the doors that, that day. He couldn't hardly walk. He couldn't make it from his car to the front door, parked in a handicapped spot. He'd get not even as far from here to that front road, and he'd have to stop, rest a few minutes, and then he'd walk a few more feet until he got here. He'd come in here and he'd sit down and he would not come up front. He absolutely would not bring himself up front. But you could catch him back there praying in his chair. Okay, he's getting there. We're getting him there. So taking some time, but he's getting there. I talked to him continuous. You know, anytime we talk on the phone. And he'd leave here sometime. Now, when he started that last few years, Lord basically told the doctors what they had to tell Bud. You gotta quit drinking, you gotta quit smoking, you're gonna die. Well, we told him that for years and it ain't worked. And uh, all of a sudden it snapped. And he come in here and he said, I had it. He told me standing right out in the lobby, I got to get right with God. It's about time. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing him back in here. After that, I don't care if he had a car. I bet Brandon bring him in. Tina bring him, everybody, if he couldn't drive, he'd have his kids drive 20 miles to come get him to drive him over here to another 30 miles to church just to be sitting in this church. He came back in, he really dedicated his life to God. He had actually been baptized once without ever being saved. He didn't have a clue. But once he did get saved, we started seeing changes in but The drinking quit. The, the, the craziness quit. Uh, he just, it was like somebody flipped on a switch and said, okay, this is how it's supposed to be. This is how you got to act. And he changed. I saw a change almost overnight in him. Like I say, it was a long time coming, just like it would be in a lot of us, like it was with me. I stepped away from the church for 42 years before I walked back in another one. And I've never regretted a minute of stepping in through them front doors over there. Yeah. Leon played John 3.16. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Yeah. But he believed that. Yeah. But he knew that. That song, the reason it was his favorite is because he lived that song. <clears throat> he had to make a decision. Do I want this or do I want another one in Budweiser's? And I'm going to tell you what, fellas, ladies, <clears throat> y'all knew and good knew he lived for that Budweiser. He worked. He kept his cooler in the back of his car. Popped him one on the way home. 
probably the hardest thing he ever done was to put down a beer to pick this up. But anybody out here, God loves you. He wants you to come into the fold with us. He wants you to know that one day, We'll be able to see Buddy again if we just believe, if we just give our hearts to God. Amen. We will actually be able to see him one more time. We'll be able to rejoice with him. And I can guarantee you, he's out of pain. He's not aching anymore. He's not having trouble breathing. He's up there giving everybody in heaven a hard time right now. <laughs> Ain't no doubt in my mind that they haven't stepped lightly around him. <laughs> but... <laughs> Anytime you need a, a church, come see us. We'll be glad to have you. If you got your own church, never step away from it. If you don't, find one of us and let us pray with you. We'll be more than happy to try to try to help you in any way we can. But just know that everybody out here, I see faces I haven't seen in many, many years. Did he just absolutely loved everybody. Uh, he couldn't always show it. He couldn't always tell it. That was the thing. He couldn't tell it. He couldn't just come out. When he told me he was dying at the car that day, he'd get back over here to church, I got to the floor. But he never said anything like that to me. I can't see where he said a whole lot that much of anybody like that. But he had a way of, of, of loving that... that you know, it just wasn't manifested there. But then, now he could tell me, oh man, I love Tina, or I love Brandon, or I love Crystal. But he couldn't tell Brandon or Crystal or Tina that I love you. Not way back then, anyway. But he's, he, the change that we saw him, and I'm sure there's a lot of you that haven't seen him in many, many years. The changes that we saw take place in him over the last I guess two to three years since he started coming here permanent was absolutely amazing. The Lord has done things in his life that I would have never, I'd have never guessed. He done things in my life I would have never guessed. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here today. I want to let Brian, uh, Pastor Brian, say a few words, the last few words, and, and close us out in prayer. Uh, you're welcome to stick around and talk, uh, rejoice, and just fellowship for a while after it's over for anybody that wants to. We'll be out in the lobby, I guess. Thank you so much. try to be obedient to what I feel in my heart God is saying. But he was a special, a special individual because he lived a hard life. But he lived that hard life through knowing there was a God. He lived that hard life around everyone here, around his family. But he had a burning inside him to know Jesus Christ. We all fight that. No matter who we are, we fight that. And even when we go to church, even when we are around our brothers and sisters in Christ, our flesh is always pulling us. And God's Word, God's Word tells us each and every day that God wants to start us on a new the next day. And God calls us. I, I was raised to kneel down at my bed at night 
And when I got out of my house, away from my parents, I never did it again. But I did it when I was made to do it. Jesus wants each and every one of us to know Him by our own heart. Not by being forced. And Jesus said a very important statement. He said, before everyone, you must accept me. But if you forsake me, if you forsake me in front of everyone, Jesus says, I will forsake you in front of my Father. How many in here today are at a place with God that you have peace? But yet, how many in here know, you know that you know you need to make peace with Jesus. All of us, each and every one of us, are called to be bold Christians. But he was a bold child of God. He had no problem coming up to an altar. He had no problem saying, I love Jesus. He had no problem stepping out and saying, will you pray for my family? I know there's a man who can give my family salvation, who has given me salvation. So I want to ask you, before we leave this sanctuary, Leon's going to play a couple of verses of the song. If there's someone here that does not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, today is the day. Now's the time. I can see Father looking over the banisters of heaven saying, come, come. And the angels in a choir behind him saying, come. Now is the time. Come. Accept Christ and have fulfillment of your life. Have a peace that goes beyond understanding. Each and every one of us have that opportunity every day. And how bad it would be to deny Christ. Do not make it to the end of the day. So as Leon plays, I'll be right there. If you want me, grab me. How great it would be to have this anniversary right here that you come to know Jesus Christ. Lord, prepare a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanks.
Especially people that grow up with you. my dad, you know, you know, Butch, Earl, all them grew up and this kid. I know this is very hard. And, and it's intimidating, you know, as an individual because the heart and mind on the same page because it hurts. But the reality is it hurts me. If y'all hold fast to each other, I promise you you'll get through this. Even that's the hardest, you know. I know it's harder for the, you know, you think about your children that you have. And that's probably the hardest part. Because I know, you know, Brandon posted on Facebook about he didn't know how to tell his daughter or whatever. I was devastated for y'all and everything, you know. We all know each other most of our lives. We're just old now, you know. But don't be discouraged by death. I mean, this ain't this ain't a mourn. Don't mourn. This is a celebration of his life. That's right. Because it's not, like I say, it's not where you start, it's where you finish. Everything else in between is trial and tribulation to learn to get where you need to be. You know, this may be a wake up call reaching one of us at the individual. Amen. But this is a family gathering. Every, I mean, it seems like every couple of years now we're all meeting in the same situation. And before we know it, we share it on the end of a new generation, and we're going to be the ones that they're celebrating or mourning. And everybody, you know, don't let the circumstances dictate the outcome of how you think or how you feel. It's hard right now, but it's going to get better. You know, like, like they were saying, if you, if you give your life to the Lord, the Lord will open up the doors to you. And he'll, he'll make the emotional hardships easier. You know, for every hardship, there's two reliefs. Amen. It's just you have to believe in, you know, believe in yourself and believe in what you're seeing. And everything is a fall place. I'm sorry, you know, for everybody. I mean, my dad, Brandon, you know, I mean, he being the strongest out of everybody. I mean, he's, I know this is hard on him as his brother. But y'all just hold fast to each other. Because one day we all will be here and we'll be in the same situation. And our kids will feel the same thing. And I, I didn't know if I wanted to get up there and speak. Or not, I mean, but I was sitting back there listening and something about his singing that got me to do it. But man, let's y'all just hold fast to each other as a family. Because you only get one chance in this life. And it's not it's not forever. That's all I want to say. I love y'all. Again, thank y'all all. best friend to Crystal for about 15 years now, and I have just as many memories of, we call them 
there with Bob, <laughs> as I think I do with my dad. And um, in all of his years of alcoholism, he was still there. He was still very present. He wasn't an alcoholic that shunned away and never saw his kids and never talked to his kids. I, mean, I have so many memories of him. Um, and he, he knew the goodness of God. He may not have surrendered to it, but he would text me or call me and he'd say, listen to this poem I wrote. And it would be the most beautiful. I mean, how can a man not born again write something so pure and beautiful? And um, so, Tina, I was with you praying like, God got his hand on this man. Um, I remember one time he blocked me on Facebook because he said I posted too much about God. He didn't tell me that until Crystal. But anyway, you know, he had seasons he didn't want to hear it. But I will say, y'all, I've been in my church. I go to a little tiny church in, on 421. I tell people you have to have the Holy Ghost to find it. And I've been there for 23 years or so. But when he started coming here, he would, I mean, this man's asked me to church so many times. And he knows I'm committed, and I'm like, well, you know, I hate to miss my church, but yeah, I'll come one time, and I'll have the biggest regret. He just wanted me to see him in the house of the Lord, worshiping and serving. That's what he wanted. He knew I was saved. He wanted to invite me to fill a pew. He wanted me to see the new man that he was. And I have that regret, but I can tell you, this is a beautiful, a beautiful spirit in this place. It's I just feel the love and the presence of God so strong here, and, and maybe one day me and Crystal will be here on a Sunday. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, she, she did say one thing uh, about Buddy. Buddy knew the Bible. For all of you knew him, he knew the Bible. But have you ever tried to argue the Bible with a drunk? <laughs> you're not, you, you're not going to win. It ain't going to happen. But he knew the Bible. He just didn't. He didn't at the time know how to apply it. Thank the Lord for him finally, a few years ago, surrendering and making it to where he's at today. Again, thank everybody for coming. I know without a doubt he's up there with a tear in his eyes. He watches all of these friends that he hadn't seen in so many years. We love y'all so much, and we'll be around for a while. So, thank you.